I don't got a reason to lie. They gave me the key to the sky. What's up, and welcome to the Weightlifting Way of Life podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan Capers, and this is Bailey Force and Dr. CJ De Palma, just co hosts. Uh, I run the show. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, who's falling that one? Co host again. I don't do anything. I just stand here. He's a computer guy. Background noise. All right, so we have an awesome show for you. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, two different things, real quick. We're going to talk about the Whoop, which is. Uh, uh, a new See how we band it. app thing. combo Watch. thing. All right, so look, you know, it's a it's a new it's a fitness monitor, right? You would say yeah. that. Yeah, it's a fitness monitor. All right, a so, life monitor. Yeah. So it, that's yeah, but uh, CJ's got one, and he he he's still on the fence, but he's going to tell us more about it. It's a uh, it's it's definitely an interesting piece of equipment. It, it seems to kind of like it's trying to answer the question of tracking everything having to do with your fitness and recovery, right? Would we say that? Yeah, basically. Okay. Do you want to talk about that first? Let's right. hear it. So the Whoop is, we'll just we'll pull up the website here, and the definition is, let's see. So Show it uh, to us real quick. No, oh, this is it. Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> I <laughs> nailed it. Walked right into that one. Um, so basically, it's a strap that is measuring heart rate at all times. It never turns off. You can charge it uh, with it still on your wrist. Um, but it is basically a strap that is telling you how we're recovering how, uh, what your HRV is, heart rate variability when you wake up, how your sleep is, is going per night. That's what I like the most about it. And we'll get into that briefly. Yeah. Cause you um, need to know that. I would like to know that because <laughs> I know my sleep is terrible. I want to know how terrible, how terrible, it, how terrible it is. Does, it, does realized, it give you on a scale of one to 10? Yeah. It's like a negative six. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's so bad. And, oh jeez, sorry. Uh, and so, okay. So basically you get this strap. And you, two options. Well, they, they did away with options. It was like four or $500 when it first came out. But now they do a membership. It's a $30 a month membership and you get access to the app. What it's measuring is recovery, strain, and sleep. So strain is what it's perceived. It's algorithm for how hard you're working during the day. So you can, it'll automatically detect your activity levels, heart rates, and things like that. So um, I can tell it to start an activity. I'm going to go do CrossFit and I can say start. And then hit end when I'm done. Or oh, so you actually have to start. No, it No, you don't have to. It oh, will okay. read it on its own. If you look at it, maybe it like started a little late because maybe you're doing your warm up or mm-hmm. whatever. It's it ended a little longer because your heart rate was so high or something like that, or yeah. ended early. Um, so you can edit it, but it will r- automatically detect activity uh, without you putting it on. Same with sleep. So what it does is it basically assesses your sleep, spits out a number for percentage recovery based on the strain from the day. In your sleep for the night, it gives you a number of like percentage recovered. So I'm not very recovered today. Uh, I slept about Obviously. four and a half hours. It says and, 35%. It actually says um, <laughs> that that's like just a little bit normal. No, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. I'm right. Wait. So, uh, and then it, it tells you your sleep performance, which I like because my sleep performance yeah. is horrendous. And it's like average disturbance is four, which is really high. Sometimes I'm at like nine. Uh, so anyways, I like it cause it gives an objective, uh, some objective numbers to something that I've never been able to assess appropriately. Mm-hmm. Um, how accurate it is. I don't know. I don't know any of the research on it or the justifications behind it, but it's just measuring heart rate and, uh, I believe heart rate variability. And through that, it spits out these, um, this data to you. Um, and we're objective with all of our training very much so. So, we like to be find a way to be objective with our sleep and recovery. So I like it. Now, the one thing I'm not sold on is, you know, I feel okay today. I'm going to train, even though this says I probably shouldn't train. Mm-hmm. And some days, you know, if I'm not supposed to train and it says you're, at, you know, 80% recovered or 90% recovered, it's going to tell you to train. So there's going to be a little bit of uh, deviation there. Uh, I haven't gone through any of that yet. I've only been wearing it a week. Yeah. Uh, but now, to, to pause and ask a question mm-hmm. real quick. It, right now it says you're thirty five percent recovered. Do you feel thirty five percent recovered? Um, I say I feel like 
I, I don't know. It's weird. I'm trying to like. Yeah, you because it's really. Have you hit a 100 percent recovered day? I've had like a 90 something. Did you feel 90? No, actually, it was the worst day. I felt the worst. Really? Yeah, because it was after a travel day, but my strain was so low, and I actually slept like six hours, which is really high for this, because it, it it like right. it starts to build its own that, responses to you. Okay, so it adjusts to you. It over adjusts time. to you over yeah, time. Yeah, because that because that's really the main question is is how does it know how hard you're working? Like right. Like I mean I mean if you. I mean, I'm sure you can relate if, you know, like if I work a, a really long day, like if, mm. I, if I'm in my office for 12 hours in a day, you know, and, and I had an easy workout the day before, I'm going to feel horrible the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it, but does, I mean, that probably doesn't equate to much straining. Right. Exactly. Right. And that's where, that's where some of the differences are. And, and you, maybe that's just my <clears throat> body lying to me. I don't right. know. It is. <laughs> Gibber. Uh, so that's that's what I'm not 100% sold on because it's solely basing all of your recovery on how you slept and what you did the day before. Yeah, yeah. There's no nutrition, um, even if you know what you did the day before, low strain, but you know worked all day, whatever, in a chair or traveled all day. Mm -hmm. um, that was the day after it showed me. I, I traveled all day, and it was like oh, 86% recovery. Now that was only the second day I was wearing it, mm -hmm. so it, could, it might not have. It, it says it takes four days to at least adjust and get an idea of who you are. Um, but you know, whatever. It'll be interesting to keep up. We'll, you know, we'll have to talk about that every now and yep. then about how your little yeah. uh, wrist experiments going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's pretty cool. I'm glad we got to talk about that. Uh, so the big thing we want to talk about today, something that we've been uh, dancing around for a little while now is, uh, trigger points. All right. And so what a trigger point is, right. It's a, it's been a hot topic forever about, uh, what, yeah, you know, uh, when somebody touches your muscle and it hurts and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, CJ, I'm sure you can do it a, a multitude better than I can. Please explain what trigger points actually are. Well, Ryan, funny you ask that. I can't <laughs> explain what they are because Why? they are not defined through research very well. Oh, okay. So, they've been trying to be defined for years. So, like on... when I bite into a steak and I find a piece of gristle in oh there, that's God. not a trigger point? <sighs> I was, I was just wondering, you know. I actually don't have a response for that. I don't even know what to say to that. Um, so uh, I'm going to reference a study uh, by Lucas et al., uh, 2009. Reliability, this is a systematic review. Um, reliability of physical examination for diagnosis of uh, myofascial trigger points, okay? So the background of the study is uh, it talks about trigger points are promoted as an important cause of musculoskeletal pain. There is no accepted reference standard for the diagnosis of trigger points, and this is known. We have no no con continuity between how people how they're diagnosed, like or what the the actual uh, pieces of the puzzle have to come together for it to be a trigger point. Right? It's been between pain, uh, taut bands, um, lack of range of motion, referred pain, uh, and a couple other things. Okay. So, with that being said, with there being no continuity and and there's no real research behind it, but you hear it all the time. Where is the idea of trigger point being taught at? Everywhere. It's taught in PT school. It's taught in chiropractic school. It's taught everywhere. And why do you think right. that is? Because the research is – because school – so schools and practice are – have been noted to be 17 years behind current research. Wow. 17 years. It's so long. Yeah. It's so, crazy. So um, – I don't have the reference for that study. I, I read it. Um, <laughs> if someone wants it, just email and I'll find it. Uh, the one person, I know you want it, email me. Um, so with that, a lot of things are just uh, outdated that we yeah. learn in school. And I say a lot of things, I mean like the majority of things. Yeah, like almost I'm not, everything. Yeah, very, very, uh, a very high ratio of like what we learn to what's outdated yeah. is, is uh, there. And, you know, yeah. it, you, like going through... Uh, a bachelor's degree in exercise science. I mean, Bailey can tell you the stuff you learn there is just abhorrent as well. Yeah. But it's 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 hard to digest that the stuff you're learning in a doctorate program mm -hmm. is just so yep. uh, is just is just equally as horrible, if right. not worse. Right. I mean that it's that yeah. it's so old and outdated and and it, unsupported. Like that that's the yeah. part that I can't. Well, get it's over. so so the thing is, it's not unsupported. It's just. Uh, antiquatedly supported i don't know if that's a word but it's it's supported through old research that has been debunked or disproven okay yeah like they all reference research but they're like hmm. referencing like 19 like ultrasound and they're referencing these 1940s and 1950s studies that 
waves somehow, you know, cause change of tissue. Yeah. Right. So, so, uh, so let me ask you this are So is a trigger point a thing? I, I don't believe so. Okay. Now you can have a, uh, you can have taut bands in the body that are painful. Hmm. Okay. And what um, is that? I mean, it's just there. So it's just a taut band that's painful. I mean, like we, we think pain has to yield dysfunction or has to become from dysfunction. And that's not true. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you can just be sore, tired. Um, and again, now I'm not saying taut bands that hurt when you press on them aren't a thing because we know they are. Defining a trigger point between hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of experts has not been able to find congruency. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. So we're cr- we've created a diagnosis that cannot be defined truly by the literature because they have to meet these um, these specific markers, mm-hmm. okay? And they're not meeting them consistently over all the studies, okay? Right. Yeah. So, go ahead. So what is so what is the research? I'm sorry, go ahead. So it, is the issue with that, like people are trying to define a trigger point is something that everybody has in a certain spot? Um, this? it's the research is, is trying to work against just like creating a diagnosis for no reason. Yeah. You know, it's like over diagnosing, right. And like, you're like releasing trigger points or releasing this like painful symptom by pressing on it. Okay. Or mashing it or whatever. Uh, we can't even prove that those are real things. So how can we utilize an intervention on something we don't know what's going, we don't truly know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. That's the issue. Absolutely. And, and, you know, trying to, trying to treat something that you don't really understand, I don't think is, is bad in itself, but I think ignoring, like you said, inconsistencies, but also ignoring the ability to actually treat something in the long term is probably the the biggest injustice of, of all you right. know the, to to just ignore that idea you know and, and i don't think it's anybody's fault uh in particular i think it's you know a lot of people just kind of get set in the ways that they're taught and are and are afraid to ask why you know are afraid to ask why is this not working what is this really why you know why aren't my patients getting any better why do i have to see the same person over and over and over for the same thing every right. time you know Right. Well, that's the thing. People get better. But now we have what's called like a post hoc fallacy, meaning like the patient came and saw you, they had pain, you gave intervention, now they don't have pain. And we believe as therapists or a, the therapist believes that what they did is the direct cause of them now not having pain. Mm-hmm. And that is not true. There are so many factors that go into play when we're talking about treating a patient, patient expectations, beliefs, language, um, buy-in, um, setting, what time of the day, you know, stress levels, all of those things. And these are all things that we can't, we're not controlling directly as therapists. We have no control over. Yeah. Okay. Um, so all of those things play a role that when we try and be very, very objective with what's going on and how they got better, it's, if we're, if being too objective with like structural and uh, physiological changes, uh, is not fair. Mm-hmm. Because it's not what's happening. Because there's so much more to a human than, uh, you know, my elbow hurts, touch me, I got better. Right. Right. And it's just, you know, that's just not how it works. So, um, so what does the research say? So this specific review, um, I like this one too. Uh, so this one, this reliability of physical examination for diagnosis of trigger points. Basically, the results. Um, so they. They had this inclusion criteria. Only nine studies were eligible for inclusion and none satisfied all of the quality and applic- applicability criteria. No study specifically reported reliability for the identification of the location. That's the big, that's another one is like identifying the actual location. So what they do is, is they have the same person, symptoms, right? Whatever, mm-hmm. trap. 25 experts come through. They have to pinpoint exactly where it is. You know, 16 different answers, right. 16 different locations. Okay. Um, so no study specifically reported reliability. Reliability is the ability to like repeat it in some form or fashion, Mm -hmm. um, for the identification of the location of active trigger points in the muscles of symptomatic participants. Reliability estimates varied widely for each diagnostic sign, diagnostic sign for each muscle and across each study. So these studies are supposed to be the top of the top and like diagnosing, 
they all have they all all of these studies had different criteria right basically different verbiage of like what they believe a trigger point is mm -hmm. so we know what a muscle is it is said muscle mm -hmm. okay we know what it looks like sarcomeres we know the physiology of it okay we know what a torn muscle looks like we know what a torn tendon looks like we know what tendonitis looks like we know what bursitis we know what they these these diagnostic these pathologies look like we don't know what a trigger point looks like yeah. by the studies, but we want to treat it. Yeah. So biggest issue there is treating something we don't know yeah. exactly what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and again, people will claim they got better. I'm like, that's fine. Just understand what you're saying, what you're doing and how that's important. But so to continue, uh, reliability estimates were generally higher for subjective signs such as tenderness. Okay. Such as tenderness and pain reproduction and lower for the objective sign, such as a top band or a twitch response. The twitch response is someone's in pain, you touch them and they jump, right? That's, that's has, has been proposed as one of the criteria needed for a trigger point. Yeah. Okay. So you touch that, they grimace or they move or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ranges for that are very poor. Okay. We don't have to go into actual numbers. So in conclusion, uh, subjectively it's consistent generally, right? But that's someone's has a tender spot. Tender spots are all over the body. They're right. normal. They're different in everyone. Um, some people have them. When they're very tender, they feel like they got this. They th they have a knot, mm -hmm. and then when they're not tender, they feel the knot isn't there. But I challenge them to always be like, I, I would I bet, bet to say the not knot's there. It's just not tender at this point in time. Right. So everyone's like, I got knots. I'm like, yeah. I bet the knot is always there. Yeah. Sometimes oh, it's you can tender. grab everybody yeah. in their trap, and you're gonna find a hard part in their trap. That right. Exactly. Is some sometimes it's, sometimes yeah. it's tender. And sometimes it's more tender. Yeah. You know, and it, depending on how hard you press, every spot in the body is pretty tender. Yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah that, for sure. That's um, what I would think. So, in conclusion, no study to date has reported the reliability of trigger point diagnosis according to the currently proposed criteria. On the basis of the limited number of studies available and significant problems with their designs, reporting, statistical integrity, and clinical applicability, physical examination cannot currently be recommended as a reliable test for the diagnosis of trigger points. The diagnosis, the reliability of trigger point diagnosis needs to be further investigated with studies of high quality that use current diagnostic criteria and clinically relevant patients. Now, when was that study uh, 2009. published? 2009. 2009. So, and where was it done at? Oh, shit, I don't know. Um, uh, School of Biomed and Health Sciences at uh, in New Zealand. Okay. And if you're interested in, in looking at that study for yourself, we'll put it in the description below. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I'm sure there's, I'm sure that's not the only one like that, right? I'm sure no, there's, there's plenty hun more. hundreds of systematic reviews that wow. say almost the exact same thing. Right. No systematic reviews come out to say that trigger points are definable and mm -hmm. a true diagnostic, uh, pathology. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw a, a pretty broad, uh, question at you and you just answer it to the best you can and we'll, we'll try and end on that. Uh, so if I'm somebody, let's say I'm a runner, right? And I come to you and I say, you know, my, my calves are really lighting up. I go to my massage therapist once a week and, and, you know, she says I got bad trigger points in my calves and they're just not getting any better. Uh, you know, can, can you help me? Hmm. What, what's your answer to that? Um, we'll go through, right. We'll do a quick evaluation uh, and you know, we'll see if there's maybe some range of motion limitations. Usually there's not. Um, and, and we've talked about like the physical treatment. I right. guess I should have prefaced the question better. We've talked about physical treatment for issues like that before, but uh, obviously there's a there's a large mental treatment to be done here, right? Because they and, think there's actually something wrong with their calves. Yeah. Right. So how are you going to attack that patient mentally? Well, so depending on on the patient, you know, everything changes. But education is our number one tool, and has been shown consistently with the literature that it is our most persistent and consistent tool against pain, injury, and uh, dis, dis, quote-unquote dysfunction, mm -hmm. um, and is our biggest tool uh, in the course of rehab. Mm -hmm. um, so we educate, right? So we educate in a couple ways, right? We have, you know, concepts of um, pain science, which is enlightening the patient, educating the patient on there's more factors involved to pain than just uh, structural dysfunction, like psychosomatic um, or... Uh, you know, and biological as well, um, social influences and, you know, things that their massage therapist or physician or other PT or chiropractor or athletic trainer, whoever has told them before, um, 
you know, uh, things like just their mental state and making it worse and all these things. So we just kind of find where the patient's mind is at, what they believe is going on. And then we just kind of talk. Uh, I've struggled as a practitioner of like just dumping, like, you know, you're an idiot. Don't think like that. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Um, I've gotten better at it, <laughs> yeah, you know, like sure. just like not, you know, this like knowledge dump into them, you know, cause we get, then we might have a little bit of a backlash, but you find ways to get their trust. Okay. And then you just start working away from this, yeah. these phallus beliefs and this basically, um, false, this false beliefhood and a physiological limitation in, uh, their, their running or their calf or whatever it is. Um, so, so how do you so, get yeah. somebody's trust and, and put their confidence in you without saying your massage therapist doesn't know what she's talking about. There's really nothing wrong with you. It's well, I would never say there's nothing wrong with them because there's things that are wrong. Right. right pain right, is still right. real. Yeah. They still have pain. I'm like, well, you know, if I always say, you know, this is what the evidence is showing about, um, you know, pain. And we talk, you know, so to this specific example, um, I always, for anyone that's actually an athlete or that is very active, we talk about volume and volume mm -hmm. first and that, you know, your body can just have, you know, these negative symptoms due to high level training and it's normal. Now we still want to address it and fix it. And then we slowly start to talk about, you know, Hey, you, you know, the research has really shown that, yeah, I know these spots are tender and I know they're there, but I doubt that's what's directly causing your pain. I think it's this like multifactorial input of, what you've been told and what has, uh, you know, what's your, what Dr. Oz is. I always use Dr. Oz, Google, and I don't know, whoever else they've mentioned yeah. usually. Um, and I try not to overload them at first. And then I'm like, well, we're just going to move, right? Let's see if we can find ways to modify your activities where you're not in pain. And then let's go from there and use that as our, basically our exercise protocol for rehab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like you do that for almost anything then. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, There's sure. no reason unless unless I see an acute injury. I don't see acute injuries yeah. that often. Someone comes in, you know, torn UCL. All right, well, surgery or non-surgical, and we're just going to take the time. Body has to do what it's going to do. But for a lot of persistent pain, um, non-acute, chronic, uh, or this kind of like tendinopathic in nature style pain, it's kind of there. It's kind of not. It's getting worse. You know, it's very activity dependent, um, or it's not activity dependent. It gets better with activity, right? Sounds like tendinitis or tendinopathy, then we just kind of take that route, right? Yeah. So it's one of two ways, you know, we go about it from, it's all progressive loading, it's all modified activity, and it's all education and understanding this multifactorial input to um, to pain, discomfort, and injury. Yeah. Movement is medicine. You heard it here, folks. That's right. <laughs> all right. You, that, that, was, that was a lot of great stuff. You can go ahead and close this cool. out. Well, thank you for listening, guys. I hope I've changed your mind on sugar points. And uh, if you think you have some, you should call me. And let's figure out why they're <laughs> acting up or why these spots are getting very tender. Um, but until then, keep moving, stop massaging, and uh, you know, make sure that your mental approach is right for exercise and training. So um, we are just a coach, an athlete, and a physio talking nonsense, trigger points, fit news, and weightlifting. Thanks, and see you next time. See ya.